you know, with this, sure, in an ideal world, nobody's private funerals would get disrupted, but in an ideal world, you wouldn't be the fucking king either. You know? The death of Queen Elizabeth II and the accession of her son, King Charles III, to the throne has inevitably started a conversation about the role of the royal family in the United Kingdom and whether we even need a monarchy at all. Very controversial questions. And of course, to discuss all of that, I'm joined by Navarro Media's very own royal correspondent, Ash. What did you make of the last week? It's been demented. Like, I, I really understand that the first death of a monarch for 70 years is a big deal that there are a great many monarchists in this country and they're going to be feeling some type of way about the death of Elizabeth II that's fine by me but when you see the institutions of the press and the state and corporations kick in to enforce this top-down mourning it's kind of nuts I don't know. What do you make of it? Is it as bad as you think? I, I, in my mind's eye, I think because, of course, the most recent example is Diana in 97, which is in terms of a natural, organic, bottom-up outpouring of grief was way bigger. I sort of didn't know what to expect. And while, yeah, the state-led, state-enforced mourning from above has been impressive in a way, like, wow, it's amazing the BBC can talk every hour for an hour about the royal family for a week. I feel like the sort of, yeah, the bottom-up stuff isn't the same as Diana. And it's not as outlandish as one might have expected. I think most people are like, she was a 96-year-old woman, sad. Okay, we have a new king. Yeah, but that's the thing that I'm drawing a distinction between. Mm. Because I remember really vividly when Princess Diana died. So I think I must have been about five at the time. I must have just turned five. And we were living with my aunt at the time. And I was watching the telly upstairs. And... I was the first one awake because I was five and everyone else wanted to have a lie. Same for me. Was, were you yeah, it was awake? a Saturday morning, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, or a Sunday morning. And yeah, so like, I woke up to the news and I started like screaming at the top of my head because I knew that it was like big news, even if I didn't fully understand it. And then like everyone came to like look at the TV. Um, in a way, the press and also the institution of the royal family itself was playing catch up to where public exactly. grief was because... Obviously, at that point, she was Diana, comma, Princess of Wales. She was no longer HRH. She'd gone through this horribly acrimonious separation from the then Prince Charles. And I think there was this sense of, well, because she's no longer an official royal, public grief will be like you would for a celebrity. Whereas actually, it was almost like Mother Teresa meets... Liza Minnelli meets Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. Like it was like a level of superstardom and almost secular saintliness, yeah. which really like struck me even then at that age. And so I think that it was a really different kind of process. It was like everyone was racing to keep up with where the public was leading. Whereas here, like if you walk around, like I was on the train um last friday and i was going up to yorkshire to see my partner's parents and i was just earwigging on people's conversations because i'm really nosy and so there was a guy kind of like sat diagonally across from me on the aisle and he was talking about how awful it was that the transport unions cancelled their strike action mm. and then there were these guys who weren't directly opposite me but sat behind that and I was listening to them and the first words that I heard were Jeffrey Epstein and it, there was just no reverence, right? There was a sense of like, oh, you know, she's died, that's kind of a big deal and like, oh, you know, haven't you seen all the barriers being put up? But there wasn't this sense of, wow, a living deity mm. has left the earth. I don't know. Is that Does that ring true of your observations of what people have been like? No, that's absolutely right. And I think there's a, there's a clear disconnect between... The reality on on the ground in terms of people's lives, and of course, we're only speaking anecdotally. Maybe people are like, well, in my community, everybody is eff effectively mourning the passing of a of a living deity, which is what this is meant to represent. Um, you know, like a secular religion. Uh, that's not my that's not my experience at all. I don't live in London. I'm sure there's people that watch this and they oh, Aaron Bastani, Ash Sarkar, they live in London. Graduates, I don't live in London. I live in you know the home of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. It's 
you know, it's quite a pro-monarchy place. I'm not saying that people are draping, you know, pro-Republican flags and getting out images of Oliver Cromwell. That's obviously not happening either. <laughs> but people are saying she was an older woman. She's passed away. We, we sort of knew it was coming. And I think with Diana, there was that visceral loss of a, of a beautiful young woman, mm. a mother of two young boys. Mm. And people can relate to that and go, oh, my God. So that was that double tragedy of, like you say, like a, a global icon a global superstar, like you say, like Michael Jackson meets Mother Teresa. And then, wow, that could be me or my sister or my daughter or my or my mum. Like a, she was not even 40, right? And incredibly, incredibly glamorous. So I think there is that big disconnect of like, well, her time has come, which I think is the default response of anybody when it's 96. I know if that's your grandparent, it's different. Of course it is. But for most people, and again, the media, despite, and maybe this is something we can talk about later on, despite these kind of, particularly English self-perceptions of stiff upper lip and restraint. <laughs> the, the state and force stuff is the complete opposite of that. It's, 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 it's like, it's, it's choreographed hysteria. I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, you've got Dan Wooten videoing himself, laying the flowers, wearing these dark sunglasses. Mm. And you just sort of think, who do you think wants to see you doing this? Who is this for? Why do you have to record yourself having a moment of quiet reflection? And that's the exact same thing which he criticized Meghan Markle for doing, by the way, when they were in Los Angeles and mm. it was Remembrance Sunday. I just sort of think, you know, this is an instance where the press, and in particular the conservative right-leaning press, are trying to lead the public and the public aren't quite following. And I think that because the public kind of haven't been following and I think that generally have been fairly measured on the whole thing. It's, you know, yes, this is historic. Yes, this is a time to reflect on 70 years of British history. Um, but she was 96 and she had a much better life than most people do in this country. Um, the press have then almost been policing expressions of dissent even harder because of it, because they know that the hysteria and the mourning amongst the public isn't coming. So I think that that's why you've got so many journalists appointing themselves as like the milk monitors of Twitter. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Like, guys, I think I've seen an American teenager do some shit posting. It's utterly unacceptable. I think it's because British public isn't coming through with the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. And the, the obsession in particular with the um, with the New York Times that you've got from the British commentaria, like, this is a liberal newspaper in a country founded on a liberal revolution and a break with monarchy, is it really that surprising that they're so going to criticise wanna, want, the institution of the monarchy? I mean, it, why are you so shocked? Do you want to give a bit of context for the New York Times stuff? You do it. Okay, all right. So there has been this long simmering beef between conservative and liberal columnists in the UK and the New York Times. And one of the uh, origins... For this beef, I'm very proud to say is that our very own Moya Lothian McLean wrote an article for the New York Times, and suddenly you've got all of these columnists who write for the Times and the Telegraph going, "Who is this nobody? Mm. You know, she barely has a platform here." She wasn't at the Spectator Garden Party. She wasn't at the Spectator Garden Party, and thank fuck for that. That's why we hired her. Um, then Kojo Karam wrote a piece for the New York Times looking at the legacies of Enoch Powell in contemporary British politics. Now, it was wildly obvious to me that his biggest detractors, including, you know, Ian Martin and, you know, even, you know, there's so many people having Time, a pop. Times columnists. Right, Times columnists. David Aronovich, people like this. Um they were, you know, they were saying, "Oh God, it's all colonialism and imperialism with this with this slot, isn't it?" Whereas actually, the article wasn't really about imperialism at all. It doesn't mention the word imperialism once. It was looking at, you know, Powell as like a proto neoliberal and how that model of having racist border policing and neoliberalism in one country is something that the likes of Liz Truss are trying to carry out now, which I thought was a really intelligent and persuasively argued piece mm. you can agree with it you can disagree with it but it de certainly deserves to have a platform and then when the queen died you had a piece by a harvard academic saying you know more than the queen as an individual but the institution of monarchy is steeped in colonialism mm. and that just seemed again to you know make all of these times columnists you know tim shipman who normally i think of as a kind of sober judge lose 
they're fucking shit. Mm. And it's not just about, here's an article that I really disagree with and here's why. It's going, why are you publishing these people? They're fringe, they're nobodies, they don't have a profile or a platform here. And it seems that the argument is that if you don't already have a column at the Times or the Observer or the Telegraph, that the New York Times shouldn't publish you, Mm. which is such a spectacularly... um, intellectually atrophied and impoverished way to think about the public sphere that I would feel embarrassed to say something like that. But here you have the leading lights of British punditry just happily letting the idiocy dribble from mm. their mouths. And what, where, are, where are the gatekeepers? Yeah, I think there's two <laughs> reasons for that. It's like, we are gatekeepers and they aren't being gatekept. They're being allowed through the gates by the New York Times, 10 million subscribers. I believe by reach, maybe it's Mail Online, but NYT has a huge global reach, right? So there's there's that bit. They're being defied as as gatekeepers, and it's important to say, thirty years ago, you couldn't get a, a UK audience accessing American newspapers and their opinion pieces and their reporting on the passing of a monarch. There's that, but I also think there's a separate point, which is a big part of their sense of self and identity as the British establishment commentariat is Atlanticism. Mm. And we're treated in a particular way by the United States. And the response by the NYT is basically covering the death of Elizabeth II, as it would with anyone. Juan Carlos could die in Spain, and they would talk about, you know, the legacies of post-fascism in Spain. And they're like, why aren't we being treated differently? You know, we we have the special relationship. I when think, you do an illegal invasion, who's there yeah, for you? It's us. Yeah. And I think, I think it was Macmillan. I could be wrong. That whole line of, you know, we are the Greeks to your Romans. <laughs> and that, like the twenty the twentieth century empire of, of 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 what was U.S. imperium after the Second World War, that was made possible. The sort of foundations for that are obviously the, it comes out of the British empires. It's it's an extraordinary peaceful transition from one empire to another, but it's still precisely that. And I think one of the one of the sort of payoffs of that is that okay, we're no longer the center of the universe. We no longer have an empire covering a quarter of the planet's surface. But what we what we do have is we're taken very seriously by the establishment of the new power that does have that centrality in world affairs. And actually, the biggest paper in New York is saying, no, you don't. <laughs> and that's like such a, it's a mindfuck for these people, actually. I mean, so let's talk about being a Republican in this context or being an anti-monarchist. Just on a personal level, how have you found it in this last week? You know, I'm I'm old. Right, I'm I'm older. I'm I'm like my late thirties now. So I I, as you get older, you can disagree with people, and I think you're like, oh, that's life, you know. And I find, what I find really strange is that monarchists view Republicans as this big homogenous mass. So, for instance, if tomorrow there was meaningful reform around the royal family, we spend less money, we stop giving you know cash to Princess Eugenie or Prince Michael of Kent or the Duke of Kent or whoever these people are, and we have a royal family like the Dutch smaller, less money, all the sort of the the political and legal bells and whistles removed. I would take that in a heartbeat. But I think they think that all Republicans don't wouldn't even engage with meaningful reform of 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 the royal family. The Queen, you know, resting in state, I'll probably go to that. It's like a national event. I'm a journalist. I'm interested in how You're people gonna go. Respond. Yeah, I think so. Of course I would. I mean I'm interested, right? But me going is not, and I think in their world, if you go to something like that, that's an acknowledgement of like the legitimacy of, of the monarchy. It's like no, this was a woman at this at the heart of, of this country's life for 70 years. I'm personally interested in how other people are going to make sense of it, personally. Or like this other one, will Prince Charles be a good king? Like, what's a good king? Yeah, he's going to be better than Prince Andrew, right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What's a good, what, what are you class- classifying as a good king? I think he's quite good on the climate. Yeah, he might be an interesting counterbalance on fracking. When Liz Truss goes to see him at their weekly meetings, so I don't think that's a particularly good idea, Liz. Now, look, he's not meant to do that. I don't want an unelected head of state interfering in in, in democratic affairs of, of government, but I agree with him on that issue. So I don't know what a good king means. And so I think, yeah, the one takeaway from, from all of this is for me, like the kind of idiocy of monarchists and establishment voices in, in how they understand Republicans. You know, it's all, it's just 20% of the country, you know, crazed, you know, we're the hysterical ones, haven't really thought about, you know, what we think, no intellectual hinterland. It's like, no, actually, the Republicans have thought a great deal about this stuff for, for centuries. You know, it's, it's you guys that aren't doing the thinking. You're the guys who are on sort of a spiritual autopilot here. I mean, when you say, like, what makes a good king, 
we've got such a strange view of monarchy, I think, at this point in time, because it's steeped in nostalgia for when we had an absolute monarchy. Mm. So the way people talk about British history is like, well, we're this tiny island and yet we ruled the waves. It's something which is very much invested in the myths of, you know, Henry V and Agincourt mm. and this idea of an underdog, which nevertheless is able to bestride the world like a colossus. And yet at the same time defends the system that we've got by emphasizing its constitutional powerlessness. Now, th that's not strictly true. The, the monarchy is powerless in the way that a nuclear power is powerless, all right? If you actually use the powers you have, it would result in mutually assured destruction, but it doesn't mean that yeah. you don't have a nuclear arsenal. And that is the nature of the constitutional settlement that we have. The monarch can prorogue parliament. It can dissolve parliament. It has the ultimate sign-off on all of our laws. Now, it would be a massive deal to the point that it would delegitimize the monarchy potentially fatally if it used any of those powers against the wishes of an elected government. But the fact is, is that it still has them. Mm -hmm. And I find that kind of contradiction of looking back through history when the British monarchy was the jeweled wing of a thuggish aristocracy <laughs> and looking to that to derive a sense of pride and yet also emphasizing a present impotence is just kind of weird <laughs> i just think well like you wouldn't choose the system if you had to um invent it from scratch and one thing that i will say in terms of what the personal experience of this last week has been like is online i have been really careful not to say things which are gratuitously offensive. Mm. And it's not because I think shit posting or making jokes about historical events is wrong. It's simply for my own well being and mental health. Nevertheless, there has been a tidal wave of racial abuse. And most of it is saying, well, if you don't like it here, go back to where your ancestors mm. came from. Now, when my grandmother was born, it was as the subject mm -mm. of the British Empire, right? She was a subject of the British Empire. Yeah, it's Empire. amazing these people don't get this, right? Right. Like Elizabeth's dad was like a king emperor. That's pretty obvious what that means. I mean, like, you know, that, and that's the context she was born into. You know, my mom was born in, in Wood Green. I have as much right to be here as anybody else. But it's telling that the death of a monarch and the accession of a new one, it's not just about mourning Elizabeth as an individual or indeed celebrating Charles as an individual. It's about using it as a battering ram for the nastiest sort of nationalism possible. And the same journalists who, like I said, have set themselves up as like milk monitors of Twitter. I mean, look, Ben Judah, someone who's interviewed us here at Navarra I like, before. I like Ben. And I like him as an individual, but I find some of his tweets on this matter totally pompous. You've had a lot of time for criticizing teenagers tweeting from their bedrooms who've got hammers and sickles in their bios but you've got nothing to say on the avalanche of racism being meted out to black and asian brits mm. who aren't seen as being sufficiently deferent or mournful and i think there's something there oh uh, yeah but i i understand this is a detour but i understand ben's support for the monarchy in a way because anglo-french he's involved in a sort of an intellectual thought world which is is transatlantic so I think that gives you a sense of, of of national attachment, which isn't normal for most people. And this is the this is the key part of the whole conversation. In a way, what nation? Right? Is he an Englishman? Is he British? Because if you had an academic or an intellectual or think tanker like Ben, who was Scottish, French, Welsh, French, I think you have quite different inflections. And I think, and this is something that this is you know we get pointy head academic or whatever but there's a good argument that says that actually after the 17th century there is no such thing as english nationalism it doesn't exist right now there is clearly english nationalism today english ultra nationalism enoch powell the edl but as a bourgeois middle class formation which develops alongside modernity industrialization english nationalism doesn't really exist and what's the substitute it's the monarchy it's the royal family important to say when somebody joins the armed forces, they're not swearing, you know, to serve the nation. They're swearing to serve the sovereign and their and their successors. Right. And so I, I I think I think that's an interesting one. So I think that's particularly a problem for Southern English people. I think if Ben was half Scottish, entirely different conversation. I think he'd have a very different civil nationalist idea of of where he's coming from. For me, I think because I'm 
I, I view myself as like Anglo-Iranian. I'm, I'm English-Iranian. I don't really think of myself as British. But here's the thing, Ash. Most people from minorities historically have because it was that imperial thing, which is all-encompassing, right? It was by nature of what it was, um, multinational, based on an empire. So if you were Scottish, Welsh, Indian, Pakistani, Australian, whatever, it can incorporate all those different things. I don't think that really works anymore. But I think clearly Ben does. I mean, that's so funny to you say that because if you were to ask me, do you feel British or English? My answer would be, well, both, neither. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, it's not something which I necessarily give an awful lot of thought. Really? Because now the reason when why- When you go to Scotland, people treat you differently to somebody who looks identical to you, identical to you, but with a Scottish accent, you'll oh, be treated differently. Oh, 100%. Because, because you're the, English. Oh yeah, but like the reason why I'm saying I don't them. think about it that often is because- you don't really have to wrestle with your identity on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. You just live it and you live it quite happily. One of the things that I find really funny, and this is a contrast, a massive contrast between me and my partner, who you, of course, know very well, um, is I have a huge interest in the kings and queens of this country. Um, Navarra's very own Nicholas Witchell. Well, I mean, it's not just the Nicholas Witchell curtain twitching who wore what and who slighted who at which event. I'm talking about from, you know, Richard II onwards, really. I've always had a fascination with monarchs. And a really big part of that is because I've always loved Shakespeare. And doing English literature, you become really invested in the history of this nation as told by Shakespeare, right? And I'll talk about it with my partner and he's like, why do you care about these aristocratic inbred so much? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I think that once you've, you know, heard like a beautiful soliloquy put into one of their mouths and you are kind of fascinated with them. And then after that, I think I was really um, interested in the process of the Reformation. I was fascinated by how Elizabeth I established herself as a power, how she used public relations in order to project a certain image of herself. I was always really interested in it. But that interest and that fascination doesn't then add up to deference. And that's the thing, which mm. is people often accuse me of, oh, you've got no interest in this country's history. No, I've got a real interest in this country's history. I just don't think that it's a great basis for continuing on into the future. I mean, let's talk about Elizabeth II for it. I was going to say, you're gonna, are you going to say the C word? I mean... Colonialism. Well, I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna have to. Um, I think let's talk, let's talk about the two massive things which shaped Elizabeth II's reign. And I think if you want to talk about what makes a good monarch, and I'm talking about what makes them good at the job that they have, I think she was a very successful monarch because she managed two yeah. huge crises very, very well. The first is, of course, the ending of formal empire and moving from Britain as a colonial imperial power to Britain as head of the Commonwealth, using soft power, its position within global markets in order to uh, continue projecting um, its power geopolitically. And then the second is the rapid growth and intensification of media. So one of the things that Elizabeth II mm. liked to say is, I have to be seen to be believed. And she's really the first monarch to have embraced television. And that's because technology was available so she was the first monarch to have a televised coronation which drove up the sales of television sets in 1953 the first monarch to televise uh the christmas address to televise you know the state opening of parliament the queen's speech and i think that's why she was able to be someone who was seen and not heard and she was able i think to use visual technology to soften the loss of status that Britain had endured through the, the <clears throat> end of empire by saying, well, what I am is mother and grandmother to a nation and I'll do that from how I look. And I think she was incredibly successful at doing that. It was also a new nation. This is the interesting thing, right? So I, I talked about English nationalism and this is a, a separate point. But her ancestors, her uncle, her dad, they were king emperors. She is the first monarch of the United Kingdom. They, the United Kingdom does not exist in their titles, right? It's Great Britain, Ireland, although Ireland obviously doesn't recognise them, I think, until 47 or whatever. Um, there's a there's a sort of strange period between it's breaking off from the Union and actually no longer having the Queen as head of state. Um, but they're effectively, you know, King Emperors. 
and that, like you say, changes decisively. It's not even in 1945 because you still have, you know, the empire. She speaks in 1947 from South Africa. She's 21 years old, and she talks. She's using viscerally, discernibly imperial language mm. about about the peoples of the British Empire, the British peoples of the empire. She calls it our imperial family. Our, exactly. There you go. You've, you've really done me a favor there by getting the correct wording. Um, but then by 1952, 1953, that's it's kind of obvious that's gone. But even then, from, say, 52 to 60, you get the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya. You have the M Malayan emergency. I mean, these are both basically wars against civilian populations involving internment, concentration camps, Agent Orange. The techniques that the Brits use against the, the Malayans is basically the blueprint for what the Americans use against the Vietnamese, which is, okay, the, the Briggs plan concentration camps, internment combined with defoliants, destroying like jungle. Interesting thing is, it works for the Brits in Malaya. It doesn't work for the Americans mm. in, in Vietnam. She she is the head of state for all of that. And I find this really fascinating. It seems to have completely disappeared from the popular imagination. They think, oh no, all, all the bad things that Britain did, if at all, if these people ever accept Britain did anything bad, tens of millions of deaths you know, it's in, the, in the final decades of the, of the 19th century, you know, Victorian Holocaust, as Mike Davis calls it. Um, and more besides, but there's nothing like that, you know, after 1945. Well, in terms of sheer scale, that's that's fair. After the Bengal famine, there's nothing really like that ever again. But the Mau Mau uprising, I think you have 1.5 million people interned, more than 100,000 people died. People are, uh, people have fed their genitals, mm. had their skin removed. You know, there's a guy who's um, active in um, in Kenya who was called the Joseph Mengele, who's a you know, mm. Nazi scientist, that's not the correct word really, but human experimentation, he's doing that on Kenyans. Similar things in, in Malaya, and she's the head of state for all this, and she's an interesting foil as a female queen for this still very brutal, aggressive military power. And a nice analogy for me is people talk about the US being an extraordinarily vile, vicious power in, in East and South Asia in the 50s and the 60s, and the fall to that is Marilyn Monroe. So you think of like American empire as like, you know, jets with bombs and then like gorgeous blonde woman like mm. smiling. And I think, you know, our equivalent is probably like the Briggs plan and like Queen Elizabeth II playing with her family. And 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 this is this is the thing, right? Which is people I think almost go down the garden path of having an argument about whether or not she's personally culpable. Mm. I don't think she's personally culpable for administering the tortures, no. right? Or for <laughs> administering the counterinsurgency. That's absurd, all right? That was military powers and the government of the day. However, you cannot choose when someone is the figurehead for the state and all that it does, and when someone isn't. She doesn't get to be the figurehead for the state when we talk about the things that make Britain great or British values and then go, oh, but actually the genocides and the tortures and the rapes and the internments, you're not the figurehead for that. It's either all of it or none of it, because that is the nature of being a monarch. And if you want to talk about some personal culpability, that crown is stuffed to the gills with stolen jewels. You've got the Koenor diamond, which used to be embedded in the peacock throne uh, during the Sikh empire, it passed from different hands. And then after the defeat of, uh, of the Sikh empire and the accession of the Punjab into the British empire, um, the handover of the Koenor from uh, Indian to British hands to the property of Queen Victoria was one of the conditions of the Treaty of Lahore. Now, the Treaty of Lahore is then considered the basis for the British crown being able to keep the Kohinoor diamond. All right, they go, well, look, it's written down. It's in a treaty. It's law. It's, it's a contract. Like, if I invaded your house... Mm. If I punched you in the head, mm. if I then took Gino, the French bulldog, and made you sign a piece of paper that I could keep him in return for no longer punching you in the head, would you consider that a lawful contract in a court of law? No, you fucking wouldn't. But that is precisely what keeps the Kohenor in British hands. The Star of Africa, uh, one of the largest diamonds ever mined. Um, it was mined in the Transvaal. And we don't know the name of the miners. We only know the name of the white mine manager, Frederick Wells, who sees the diamond presented to him by his workers. What were the conditions like for those workers in the Transvaal? I don't know if they were um, black or white. I don't know if they were, you know, white impoverished labor or practically indentured black labor. But I think it's safe to say that their conditions were pretty crap. Um, the fact that it falls into British hands is 
precisely because of colonialism, imperialism. These are stolen and looted goods which are paraded around during state banquets and coronations as a symbol of how great we are. It's like if the craze were wandering around the East End with bags full of swag and loot and going, well, this is what makes us great, sorry. Mm. You know, we'd call them criminals and thugs, except when aristocrats do it, we call them your majesty. Mm. And also there's that whole, the, the discourse of modernization and modernity. You talked about um, Enoch Powell earlier on, and he prefigures Margaret Thatcher in a really interesting way, which is to say he wants a modernization of the British state and civil society and the economy, particularly the economy, Thatcher's the same, that stops at the gates of Buckingham Palace. You don't, mo- don't touch a thing, don't touch a hair on her head, <laughs> but we can completely remake British civil society, and we can unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of the British public. But this this thing here, like this central beating heart of of what it means to be British in the British state, can't can't be touched. And so I think that's that to me is again a really interesting contradiction. We see that still today. You know, you have striking workers of anti trains or RMT workers in the London Underground or Royal Mail workers. Um, uh, you know, who are being represented by the CWU, the CEOs always say the same thing. You are rejecting modernization, you know, the inevitability of upgrading the networks, get with it. It's the 21st century. Hello, the head of state sits on a giant golden throne, like you say, surrounded by stolen gems from the last two and a half centuries of colonial conquest. What, wh- why is that not a relevant conversation there? But when it comes to pushing down people's wages and their living standards, <laughs> modernization, get, get with it, man. Well, <laughs> If you if you try and apply that same discourse to literal literal people who are at the apex of of how we run our society, and by the way, it's not just the king or the queen; they have this whole sort of retinue around them and a sort of aristocratic, you know, pyramid beneath them, particularly around land ownership, mm. which is in, entirely feudal. You know, one of the wealthiest people in this country, the Duke of Westminster, he ain't wealthy because he started a company. He ain't wealthy because, as much as I dislike Bill Gates or Elon Musk, you know, he ain't he ain't wealthy because he tweets mad shit and like <laughs> inflates the share price of his companies, right? He's wealthy because he inherited it, and that's like loads of real wealth in this country, particularly around land. So the idea that you have to modernise the economy, you know, modernisation means zero hours contracts for people. Well, why not modernising the Duke of Westminster? Why not modernising land ownership in Scotland? I think you've got half a dozen families own, you know, maybe half the country, maybe more. No. We can't modernise that. It's sacrosanct. I mean, and, and and this is the thing is that, you know, the contrast between, you know, the Queen as an individual public figure where her defining qualities were always seen to be duty and hard work and a kind of thriftiness and the reality of monarchy as an institution, I think, is something which is really striking. And again, that's why I think that she made a good Queen in terms of getting the job done, which is she was able to leverage her experiences during World War II. She was very famously a mechanic and maintain that as part of her public perception as somebody who was actually kind of, you know, humble and down to earth. One of the things that she really liked to do with prime ministers is get them in the back of her Land Rover, drive them around Balmoral, and then they'd stop at a bothy and Prince Philip would be there manning a barbecue and the prime minister would say, oh, and they did the washing up. And that was a spectacular bit of public relations in order to conceal the reality of a absurd historical uh, inherited wealth Mm. steeped in historical crimes as well um under this veneer of domesticity and normality very very smart move on their part to do it like that speaking of domesticity and kind of invisible labor what did you make of uh, prince charles reacting to his courtier courtier sorry failing to move the desk do you want to show me the video yeah well should we get it up Yeah, yeah, yeah a moment King Charles III furiously motions for aid to move inkpot as he signs proclamation. Oh, there he is. Oh, my God. Uh, shoot. That looks sweet of the hand. Oh, my God, he's still doing it. Bro, just move it yourself. Show me again. I kind of want to see his face. Well, he does it twice, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of like an aloof, like... Yeah. There's another one in a minute because he needs to like, Chop. yeah, there's another one in a sec. I mean, look at the size of that chandelier. Nobody talks about modernising the lighting in, in Buckingham Palace. That's a lot of electricity. Do you think it's got energy efficient light bulbs? <sighs> here, we're coming back here, look. Okay, all right. Look. 
Oh no, there's a little ink oh, no, in the no, way. There's something in the way of my, my hand. It's obstructing. I can't sign it in this. He's clearly like a clean freak it? as well. He's like brushing non-existent dust. Oh my God. That face. That let's, face. Go, let's go back. Computer. Enhance. Enhance. Oh. He's like the spitting image Charles puppet. Jesus Christ. What do you make of that? What do I make of that? Mm. If my mum ever saw me behave like that, she would abandon every oath, every guideline that she promised to uphold as a social worker and beat the shit out of me. I mean... But she wouldn't leave a mark, right? Because that would be illegal. That would be illegal. That would be illegal. Um, and also she wouldn't do that. She really preferred really long lectures. At, at the end of them, you'd be like, mom, please could you just beat me like other people's parents? All right. I want to meet somebody. <laughs> like, please, mom. Um, but no, I mean... <sighs> So I understand it's an intensely pressured day, the context of grief yeah. and all of that. I really do understand that. But Prince Charles is someone who had his valet squeeze out toothpaste for him onto the toothbrush. This is somebody who has spent their life living in a context where everything is done for him. And you compare that to the queen. And again, this is as individuals who can manage their public perception. She was able to present herself as a roll up her sleeves and muck in kind of person. Very self-reliant, you know? Self-reliant. Yeah. I've got no idea how much of a basis in truth that has because I'm never going to know what she's like, you know, pottering around all of those palaces. But she was able to project that kind of sense of self. Whereas Prince Charles, on the moment where he's becoming king, all the cameras of the world are on him. He can't look like a normal person or even a gracious king. Mm. You know, he can't even just like wait and ask like, oh, could you come and take this? Yeah, the gracious point's really important. Right? So he can't be a gracious king and he also can't be a normal person just moving something Mm. with his own hand. A spectacularly weird guy. And even though the press are trying to kick into overdrive and praise him for any hint of a normal thing that he does. And right now, lots of the media coverage is marked by this sort of wild sycophancy. They're not going to be able to compensate for what the public see with their own eyes. Those little gestures, those little flickers on the face, particularly when monarchs don't talk very much, that's what we see and that's what we know them by. So Mm. you've gone from dutiful, self-reliant, hardworking queen to Mm. that. That tells a story. I do think as well that that thing about if we have an alternative reality and you have a king come on the throne 52 53 and they're atop of this 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 pyramid of power during the Mau Mau um, uprising Malayan emergency Northern Ireland bloody Sunday Margaret Thatcher minor strike and if it was a king like Prince Philip sort of a, a military man quite assertive quite domineering mm. probably would have some sort of traits like you have with Prince Charles there quite entitled and so on how much differently would history have been maybe? You know, how, mm. how much less support and consent might there be for for the royal family and the concept of monarchy in this country? I'm not saying we'd be a republic, but I, I would suggest it would be significantly lower in terms of support than it is today. So this is something which is really critical to understand, which is that this very domesticated image of the queen was central to how she reinvented the job of the monarch. So... Her private secretary, Martin Charteris, described what it was like when she was at these big Commonwealth conferences, because, of course, she was head of the Commonwealth. He said that it was like when nanny or mummy would come down. And if, you know, these unruly children, i.e. other heads of state, were, you know, falling out or acting up, she would sort of give them this look which said, no more bloody nonsense from you. (laughs) Now, that is a spectacularly condescending way to talk about the heads of state of previously colonized countries. Mm. But that tells you a little bit about the game of images being played here. Um, And I think it would be different if you had someone who was a military man, someone who's very domineering in that role, because you wouldn't be able to soften that relationship of domination and hierarchy through the lens of gender. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, it's a similar thing to what Thatcher does with, you know, her revolution in, in the 80s, right? If it was a male prime minister trying to push that through and taking people on and being as aggressive as she was, but coupled with like the, you know, the archetypes of, of what we think of as male domination and power, I think it would have been very different. I've got a question. Go on. All right. Charles and Diana, mm. what do you remember of it? 
Well, you know what? My mum wasn't a my mum was a Tory voter actually. Um, <gasps> yeah, she's a Tory voter. Well, I'm from I'm from Revelations. Bo- I'm from I'm from. Uh, uh, she was a Tory voter. Yeah, I think she pre vote Lib Dem as well. But I was from Bournemouth. She was a uh, woman in the 80s who ended up starting her own business. She was a cleaner as well, but she had a business briefly. She had a sandwich shop. And I think I think she saw, saw a certain zeitgeist there, which is like a woman standing up for herself, be a Thatcherite. She wasn't a Thatcherite. She was never a Tory party mm. member or anything like that. It was, in a way, it's more powerful than that, right? Because mm. she was emotionally invested without being politically invested, which yeah. is like, which is why Thatcher was, was so successful in this country, I think. Well, because Thatcher always presented herself as being quite humble yeah. ideologically. She was a deeply ideological person. She was very serious about her ideology. But she would say, you know, I'm often accused of preach- preaching the homilies of the housekeeper or the parables of the parlor, but I'm proud of it because it's the woman who knows the price of milk, mm-hmm. you know? And it's, again, the way in which gender kicks in to soften this ideological scaffolding. Yeah, but my mum, you know, she loved Diana because she, I remember her doing volunteering work with a hospice, an AIDS hospice or end of life care and so on. And of course, and I think, did she do that? Because like Diana made it like cool, like... Diana made, cool is maybe the wrong word, but Diana showed it was socially acceptable. And my mum was like, wow, this incredible woman is doing this. I want to imitate her. And I imagine that was pretty quite a common thing, you know, like I want to be more like this incredible person. And when she died, when Diana died, I because I told my mum on the Saturday or the Sunday morning and I just didn't expect it, like wails, howling, screaming. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I think because probably similar age, she had a son, similar age to, mm. to Diana's boys. I think Prince William's like, what, he's 39? Um, the, the new Prince of Wales. So I, 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 that really shocked me. And she despised Charles. She despised Charles and Camilla. Um, she wasn't a Republican. And I do wonder what would she make of, you know, King Charles III? Mm. I mean, I, I, I find this sort of sequence of Queen Elizabeth II Diana, Princess of Wales, and Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, really, really interesting. Because Queen Elizabeth II obviously uses gender to soften the image of the crown. But the most difficult moment in her reign really was when Diana was killed in Paris and she was seen to be insufficiently responsive to the nation's grief. So even steadfastly monarchist newspapers like the Mail and the Express ran headlines like show us you care in the heartless house of Windsor. So this was a moment where the queen was being criticized because she was seen to fail in her job as mother to a nation. And it's interesting Mm. to me that Diana represented an opportunity for the monarchy to modernize itself in terms of how it undertook public relations. Diana married into the royal family very, very young. Uh, She was still a teenager when she first met Prince Charles. And she describes herself as being kind of like a lamb to the slaughter because she entered this institution and mentally it broke her down. She suffered with bulimia, self-harm, attempted Mm -hmm. suicide. And she found the institution itself incredibly uncaring and unwilling to protect her from a lot of the tabloid press intrusion. I think that certainly before she married Charles and after their separation, the institution left her totally unprotected. But I think the reality of when they were married was that the institution found itself quite powerless in the face of tabloid press intrusion. So there was very famously a kind of sit down meeting called by the royal press officer who sort of said, right, no more of this. You know, she's pregnant now. You kind of have to lay off. And then afterwards, the queen herself circulated as kind of a reward amongst these editors. And then two weeks later, they published a photo of a very heavily pregnant Princess Diana wearing a bikini. So it was kind of, she. it's open season. And, and you know, the, the palace could do very little to control that. But after the end of the marriage, she was on her own. And the things that she stood for in the public eye were one being a wronged woman because everyone knew that she'd been cheated on throughout the entirety of her marriage, but two, a kind of open-armed, warm and generous style of being a royal. She was very hands-on as a parent with William and Harry. So there were always photographs of them 
in her arms being held very close that was something which you never really saw with uh the queen and her children and also that sort of close contact being a feature of her charity work very famously embracing and holding the hands of uh patients who were dying of aids and the royal family didn't adjust to it at all. They didn't learn any lessons from it. In fact, they felt very threatened by mm. it and tried to distance themselves from it. And it was a real misjudgment of the public mood. And again, here comes Meghan Markle, who is beautiful. She's biracial and she's got a career of her own. And this represents an opportunity for the royal family to show that they are moving yeah. with the times. And again left unprotected in terms of press intrusion. And also this is press intrusion coupled with, you know, real undertones and sometimes overtones of racism. And, you know, when it comes to the the mental health toll of existing within this very weird family of people who behave bizarrely towards each other, um, you know, it really ground her down. And I just think... You know, yes, the Queen was able to change some of the public perception of monarchy, but here come two massive opportunities to ingratiate yourself with the public, to show that you've changed. Diana, Princess of Wales, and Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, just, you know, isolated, marginalised, distanced themselves from them. There was that video of um, Meghan Markle basically being ignored by several women but i think yeah. there was one woman in particular who was kind of side-eyeing her yeah, let me find it let me find it so megan markle woman crowd so this is the this is the snub yeah and so just keep an eye out on like that woman's eyes and the like little gesture with the head and the thing is she's like megan markle is saying hello to lots of other people and it's just this one woman Look, people can like and dislike who they you know they like. It's a free country. She, she doesn't like her. That's that's fine. But the media was so gleeful mm. to to take that as the public hate Meghan Markle. Whereas I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Well, I mean, if you're a per- clearly a lot of people really like her. Yeah, I mean, also like I'm not I'm not one of those people that looks at. Diana or Meghan and goes, well, if the royals were like this, I'd be fine with the monarchy. No, I still wouldn't be. But there are two examples of people who were within the institution being abominably treated because they deviated from this really archaic script of what royals are supposed to be. When it comes to that moment of interaction with like Meghan and that woman in the crowd, every person of colour in this country is familiar with it, where you're reaching out to somebody and they fucking loathe you and they are doing everything within the power of their facial muscles to make it clear and yet you have to respond with total grace and poise because if you don't you're the angry black woman you're the hostile brown woman you know so on and so forth you know i think there is a big difference between how middle-aged people including women view Meghan Markle and younger people because that is a reaction from a middle-aged woman that I recognise. I actually almost got in a fight over a similar react, sort of response to that. Yeah. Recently, yeah, I was walking my dog in the middle of summer. So obviously I'm, I'm half Iranian, so I get I get quite dark. And then Iranians are actually whiter than like Scots during the winter. It's a very strange, <laughs> very stra- strange skin tone. Um, my dog, you know, he did a crap in the park. <laughs> and before I could even pick it up, I could see this old guy looking at like disgust. And he probably just presumed I'd have an accent. That I was, you know, non-native speaker, some foreign guy here. I was wearing tracksuit, oh, some slob, mm. right? And I said, "Are you okay, sir? Is there a problem?" And I, I couldn't help but like start, effectively mm. start a fight. I said, "Is there?" Just looking rather strange at my dog having a poo. I just find it odd. Sorry, he was taking his granddaughter to school or something. He's like, oh, "God, this fucking wacko starting a fight with me." <laughs> but I can't help myself because for me, like you say, I, you've seen these little slights and gestures your entire life, and I, I don't, and maybe. In his defense, maybe I was misreading him. Maybe he has some like phobia around, you know, dog excrement. Who knows? I don't think so. Uh, she, I mean, did she have a choice there? Could she have sort of, she thinks she could have gotten the lady's sort of face a bit and said, uh, hey, you know, how I'd, you doing? I'd, I'd, I'd have been that like- would have been, been the English thing to do, right? Is to like confront the social awkwardness and go, hello, how are you? And like pretend everything's fine. I'd be like, is there something wrong with your face? Mm. I, but that's, I guess, why I'm not Duchess of Sussex and why she is. I mean, 
let, let's talk about kind of the extended cast a little bit more because obviously the two really big recent scandals have been Harry and Meghan and Prince Andrew. And weirdly, the press seems insistent on placing these two events on some kind of parity as, oh, look how much pain, you know, these wayward children have caused the Queen. One, the alleged crimes are nowhere near being equal. You've got Harry and Meghan responding to what they feel were callous responses of the institution towards their suffering at the hands of the press. And you've got Prince Andrew being alleged to have had sex with a trafficked minor who was a victim of Jeffrey Epstein. She's a minor in the US. She was she was 17, right? Uh, she was 17. But of course, in this country, a trafficked yeah. person who's being coerced cannot consent. I know, so but there's, there's, some, there's, somebody, there's some people saying, oh, she was 17. But I, I think there was also there was three occasions. One of them mm. was in the United States. Also, she alleges battery. Mm. So it's not just... I mean, I mean, it's, it's the way it's, it's been written off by some people. I just find puzzling. I mean, it's also, you know, I remember being seventeen, right? If I was seventeen and having sex with somebody who, what, he was in his forties or fifties then? I think forties. Right. So this is when allegedly the events took place. Sure, I could legally consent, but. In a context of being trafficked and surrounded by oh, of adults, of course, no, of course. I mean, you know, like, you know, the 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 notion of of consent is is totally farcical. No, but I, that, I, I, I say that because, of course, you get supports yeah. of the monarchy who will try and find ways out for him. Oh, and, you yeah. say, and you say, look, they don't exist. Just accept he's a really bad guy. Okay. But if but if you want to look at the different responses of the institution, mm. um. Immediately, the institution responded to distance themselves from Harry and Meghan. And you could also see a real viciousness on the part of their attack dogs amongst the royal correspondents working for the Telegraph and the Times mm. and all the rest of it. It was really, you know, these two are no longer protected. Get your teeth into them. Um, but with Prince Andrew, it was like the institution was forced to take those symbolic steps of, you know, stripping him of, of his military honours, although he still, of course, has the title of Prince and Duke of York. Um, you know, he was taking a bit of a step back for a little bit in terms of public events. But the Queen contributed, I think it's uh, reported £2 million to the payoff, which settled the case with Virginia Giffray. Now, that's not a morally neutral thing to mm. do. You know, Virginia Giffray alleges that Prince Andrew raped her. Prince Andrew denies those allegations and will never get a day in court where those allegations can be tested because Prince Andrew was able to use his access to inordinate wealth to silence it forever. And you know what's even more remarkable in a way in terms of the of the of the attempted whitewashing of Prince Andrew and, and how that relates to the treatment of Prince Harry. Harry can't wear his sort of military gear at the Queen's funeral on the Monday, but Andrew can. <laughs> and Harry obviously was in Afghanistan and uh, Andrew was in the Falklands. So you can you can see why they would both wear it or neither would wear it. But the fact that one is being explicitly told, no, you can't do this. You can't present yourself as, you know, that that military archetype, which is again central to the idea of like the royal family in this country. But this chap can, because, you know, we want to... Um, and sort of rehabilitate his mm. his his reputation, launder his reputation. I mean, that in itself to me is just such an obvious sign that this is a really toxic, corrosive institution. It's not like, well, look, he's not been found guilty of anything. He'll be treated the same as everybody else. I would never agree with it, but at least it's, it's legible, it's understandable. But the fact you would, to this day, still try to toxify one guy's reputation while redeeming another's, and given what Andrew's allegedly done... I mean, I think that says a lot about the royal family and, and the press, and it's not good. I mean, look, it's also really well known that Prince Andrew was the Queen's favourite child, right? Everyone knows this, that she had a really distant relationship with Prince Charles, and we could talk about that more in a second, but she had a really close one with Prince Andrew, something of a favourite, really enjoyed the fact that he was vivacious and cheeky and all the rest of it. So, you know, 
putting that two million pounds into uh, the settlement for Virginia Giffray is a kind of endorsement of his character, I'm afraid. And then you don't get to do this thing where, you know, the queen is just this lovely old lady who did nothing wrong, but here's the institution and that's bad and you criticize it all you want. No, she is, I think, morally culpable for those choices that were made. And also, like, you know, we're using the word allegedly because we have to, right? And he's not been found guilty mm. and we have the principle of innocent until proven guilty as we should. But let's take some of his defenses and excuses and alibis on their own, yeah. uh, you know, on their own face. He claimed in that now notorious Newsnight interview that he couldn't have been at a nightclub with Virginia Giuffray on the night alleged because he was in a Woking Pizza Express for one of his daughter's friend's birthday parties. His lawyers were, una were unable to find a single corroborating witness who could testify to that fact. Similarly, Prince Andrew claimed that it was absurd to claim that he was sweating all over Virginia Giuffray on the dance floor because he had a medical condition which meant that he couldn't sweat at the time. There was not a shred of medical documentation that his own lawyers were able to mm. find that could support that claim. He also claimed never to have met Virginia Giuffre. Well, there is a photograph of someone who appears to be Prince Andrew with his arm around the waist of Virginia Giuffre with Ghislaine Maxwell standing in the background. If Prince Andrew was any ordinary man and those defenses were presented in either a civil or a criminal court, they would have been ripped apart. They would have been ripped apart. Now, I can't say whether he'd have been found guilty or whether he'd have been acquitted. I don't know the strength or the weakness of the rest of the evidence or testimony involved, but those three things would have been utterly torn to shreds. And it's only by virtue of his wealth and his power, both of which are entirely unearned and come from his position within the royal family, that he was able to squash this case once and for all. And the queen does bear responsibility for that because she was a party, a financial party, to that settlement. Do you think that's going to stay with her? So obviously people people in 20, 30, 40 years are going to assess her, her reign. And I do think that's going to be like a massive black mark. I, mm. I really feel like that. And I, I think... People now, because we're you know, it's sort of got the fog, fog of war is a strange term to use, but I think whenever you have a, a big moment of national mourning trauma, that's kind of what is happening. I, it's clearly going to be indefensible in, in, in 10, 20, I mean, it's already indefensible. But for the people that reflect on, on her reign, I just think, why on earth did you do it? And I suppose, that, again, the defence from a, a supporter of the monarchy or a supporter of Elizabeth II, she was a good mother, she protected her son as a good mother would do. Okay. I, you know, again, like you say, if this was any normal person, any normal mother, I think we'd find it quite, quite, you know, I mean, unacceptable behaviour, actually. So one of my favourite all-time uh, plays of Sha William Shakespeare is Julius Caesar. And there's the famous funeral speech given by Mark Antony. And Mark Antony uses that funeral speech in order to repair the reputation of the murdered Caesar and create a mood amongst the mob which would support him and Octavian against Brutus. And what that sequence shows us is that the period following the death of any leading figure, whether it's a monarch or a politician or a military leader, is a very potent time mm. for creating consent and buy-in for whatever happens next. And one of the great ironic lines of that speech is the evil that men do lives after them the good is oft interred with their bones so let it be with caesar mark antony is lying through his teeth when he's saying that because he wants to bury the evil and make the good of caesar live on forever and that is exactly what's happening now anything which could be seen to tarnish the personal reputation of elizabeth ii is being very deliberately buried. You've got disgraced members of the royal family like Prince Andrew cloaking themselves in the garb of mourning in order to restore their personal reputations. And you've also got the pomp and circumstance of the funeral and the kind of social norms of funerals that they're special times where we don't say all the things that we mean. We do hold our tongues being used to wave through the accession of an unelected head of state. Um, so yeah, I mean, if anyone wants to learn about how power really works, Julius Caesar, you could do a lot worse than starting there. So we've been talking about all of this. 
about how the Queen is guilty of certain things, about how the monarchy is implicated in in colonialism, uh, how it's an anti-democratic force in British civil society, it's anti-modern. Why is republicanism so unpopular then? And of course, we're talking about Prince Andrew. We've seen in the last sort of four or five years, support for the monarchy has gone down actually by about sort of five, ten percent. It's really noticeable, but an alternative doesn't really seem on the horizon either. The English are very good at three things. Irony, Sunday roasts, and burying their own history. So one example of burying history we see with Operation Legacy, the deliberate attempt to destroy files relating to how the colonies actually functioned, what went on in them, and what kind of horrors were committed in the name of the British Empire. But another process, and it's a lot less dramatic, and it is the work of centuries rather than a few years, is the way in which we have buried our own history of of republicanism. We were, um, we beat France in the race to behead a monarch. Um, We put a king on trial. We had a republic for a while. And during that time, before really things settled down and you have Oliver Cromwell, who of course behaved like a despot, put entire towns and villages in Ireland to the sword, you had this moment of revolutionary democracy Mm. where in the Putney debates, you've got these great speakers like Thomas Rainsborough making the argument for universal suffrage. And this is in the 1640s. We have buried that history and deliberately marginalized it. So one of the really funny things that's happened in the last few days is that I've had so many people say, well, why don't you fuck off to a Muslim country then if you don't like it here, if you don't like our monarchy? And I'm like, well, look, one, lots of Muslim countries actually have kings. I'm not so keen on those ones either. And two, the most successful Republicans in this country's history have been white and Christian. We've just totally suppressed and buried that history. Yeah, and as well, it's amazing for me. There's this moment, which isn't really talked about much actually in English history, of Cornet George Joyce, who I think is the, basically the lowest ranking officer in in the sort of in the Roundheads in the Parliamentary Army, and he is the one who arrests King Charles the uh, First, who's on the run, obviously. And I think people are sort of like, "Can you do that? Can you know this? This isn't even a, this isn't an elite, a nobleman. He can just arrest a king, really." As Charles the First said at the moment of his arrest, "On whose authority?" Precisely. But now, could you do that, really? If you like, you know, a, a low-ranking like police constable, could they really arrest? A... We were doing it 350 years ago, you know. And like you say, like that's just been completely annihilated, erased. Even now, in discussions of the monarchy in this country, people say a thousand years of continuity. Hmm. Really? You know, we don't really talk about this much. But the crown jewels we see today, which we think as archaic and you know, ancient and venerable. Cromwell, for his many, many faults, he melted down the crown jewels. He just completely destroyed the crown jewels. All the crown jewels you see today are from the from the restoration of King Charles II. That is when the modern idea of the monarchy, which was saying is a thousand years old, actually no, it starts really in the in the 1680s. That's when this dates from, and it's it's a response. I still feel like actually, Ash, this this instinctive hatred of of Republicans, dismissal or how stupid. I almost feel like it's an inherited intellectual gene for the British ruling class because there's still this fear of like, there was this moment when Mm. all of our certainties collapsed. And okay, it didn't work out very well. Important to say Oliver Cromwell named his own son as his successor as Lord Protector. It was again, you know, it was a a, a hereditary monarchy in a way. I think we've always preferred the diggers. We prefer. I wasn't a Crom. I'm not a big Cromwell guy, <laughs> but you know there was there was a broad movement, and it was led by somebody who you know uh, wasn't particularly politically good. I mean, he banned Christmas again. That's another one, right? People are, oh, the left they want to ban Christmas, and you think that's kind of what Cromwell did. Is this just something that people have been saying for 330 years to sort of undermine and demean political forces that they don't agree with? I mean, maybe you know, maybe this moment was so gigantic that it's still informing you know headlines in the Sun newspaper in 2022, possibly. I mean, what I find totally mind-boggling is how few people there are defending the right to heckle 
a prince, a princess, a king or a queen in public. Now, a private funeral is a private funeral, but what's going on isn't a private funeral. Mm. It's a public yeah. political constitutional process. I didn't choose the system of inherited <clears throat> power where one person dies and another person immediately inherits it, right? I didn't choose it. You guys did. So unfortunately, you don't get days off of political criticism during the mourning period because that's actually when the transfer of power is happening. And you've got, you know, who's that um, Who's that wetty for Labour first? Luke Akehurst? There we go. Um, saying, well, heckling, uh, you know, at the proclamation isn't freedom of speech. Freedom of speech would be having your own rally somewhere else. It's like, no, it's precisely freedom of speech. The, be able, the ability to dissent in front of power, mm. not just away from power. And I was thinking about, you know, when, uh, you know, George III was heckled uh, by oh, someone, some kit something, I can't remember. He did a bit of time in prison for it. So that, that was seen as the actions of a despot of a weak and insecure and authoritarian leader. Whereas now we're applauding it as being a defense of good taste. And it's one thing for, you know, Luke, what's his name, to not uphold socialist principles. That's fine, I never expected him to. But to not even uphold liberal principles. Mm. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, Xi Jinping, Right. If he dies and there's a similar process and his coffin's going through, you know, the streets of, I don't know, Shanghai or Chongqing or wherever, and somebody starts booing it and says, no, you're a despot, or they talk about concentration camps in Xinjiang or whatever, and then that person is arrested, we would say, wow, that's awful. That can never happen here. It happens here. It has happened here. It happened just now. I think what's actually mo- most remarkable for me, Ash, is the level of of self-censorship mm. like that. I mean, that guy was lucky in a way people was like, well, yeah, he was arrested, but he would have been in a way he's lucky the police were there because the crowd would have beaten him black and blue. And that's probably correct, you know? And, and yet these people think that we're so different to Russia. And of course we are in many ways, of course we are Russia or China. But if you're saying that it's unacceptable for somebody to boo in you know, the coffin of somebody who's passed away, the former head of state, well, if that happened with Putin or with Xi Jinping, I think, I think I know what those people would say. Oh, that person shouldn't be going to prison. Wow, that's a despotism. So what makes it different here? Oh, well, it's impolite. It's mourning. So all of a sudden you move like what is legitimate political grievance into the sphere of like ethical comportment. I mean, it's just not on. It's just not right. And that's not, that's not how we do things here. You know, it's, it's unethical. And, Always a way out. And, and again, it's like, I didn't choose this fucking system based on bloodline superiority, where you have a living embodiment of the state and the renewal of that state has this frightening literalism of the death of an individual and the accession of another. It's really crazy, right? right? Like, you 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 want to take important political decisions like in the moment of trauma. That's the basis of monarchy. I mean, and and the thing is, is that a democratic society renews itself at the ballot box right it is you know the contestation of a general election it is the inauguration of a new head of state all right that is the renewal of the state and that is also a time which we recognize as a time for dissent and also for protest whilst we you know accept the democratic legitimacy of what's going on that's something which we recognize whereas you know, with this, sure, in an ideal world nobody's private funerals would get disrupted but in an ideal world you wouldn't be the fucking king either you know, 